Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second episode of IFI Spotlight 2020. Um, we are uh, in the process of migrating a number of our theatrical uh, strands online, and we're very pleased to be able to present Spotlight uh, on this digital platform. Um, we're very grateful as ever to the Arts Council, our primary sponsor, uh, who are our constant supporters uh, in regular times and in these unusual times. We're, we're very grateful to them for their support and the belief in our activities. And for today's event, uh, we're particularly grateful to the BAI and they have supported IFI Spotlight this year. They have in previous years, of course, presented uh, in this uh, gender slot and uh, their efforts in uh, creating a level playing field for women uh, in the film and television industry is of course significant. Um, this morning's event uh, will be a mediated conversation uh, with doctors uh, Annie Duna and Dr Susan Liddy and they will speak on return to gender. Um, the, their conversation uh, will be followed by an opportunity for you all uh, to uh, field your questions uh, to Annie and Susan. Um, I expect with so many of you joining us, uh, I understand that there's, uh, we're sold out, there's a hundred people here. Um, I, so it may be the case that not all of your questions can be answered. So we'll, there will be a, a, some process of filtration with your questions that we'll field, field to Annie and Susan. Um, I would urge you to put your questions into the Q&A box rather than in the chat box. Uh, you may chat away among yourselves. Um, I don't think I'll be paying any attention to that, uh, but the Q&A box we will be keeping an eye on. Um, the, Questions then will be followed by a bonus feature. We're very pleased uh, that Una Mullally will be joining us uh, to launch Susan Liddy's book, uh, Women in the Irish Film Industry. So that will be uh, interesting uh, to hear what, uh, to hear Una's response to, to the conversation and to, to launch Susan's book at the end. We hope to wind up shortly after midday. So I think um, brace yourselves for a very uh, illuminating hour on, on uh, women in the Irish film industry. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, Spotlight, as, as you know, is, is our annual moment where we reflect on what has been produced in Ireland uh, in film and television over the past year. Uh, it is uh, now in its eighth year and uh, the, the, the strand is invaluable, I think, in allowing us all to engage more critically uh, with film and television. Uh, there are learnings each year. And uh, the topic of gender is one uh, which is a constant uh, in spotlight. Um, we have paid attention to representation and underrepresentation of women uh, in Irish film and television for, for many, many years now. And I think as part of spotlight, uh, we ourselves in IFI, um, in reporting on our provision uh, for women on the big screen, uh, we it came to our attention that that there was a level of underrepresentation. So we have actively sought to uh, seek out women filmmakers um, so that there would be a, a more realistic representation of life as we know it on screen. Um, life is lived by 100% of people and for many decades uh, that life was represented by only 50% of those people. So um, the IFI programme is gradually uh, reflecting uh, all of our lives on screen. We introduced the F rating uh, soon after a spotlight uh, acknowledgement of its value as uh, so the F rating which um, would celebrate the work of women directors and writers and you know we would work annually to increase uh, the number of films that would uh, pass the F rating and in 2019 just to check in with you just to let you know that 102 of the 394 films we screened met the F rating so that was 25.89 percent uh, of our provision uh, in 2019 um, was uh, women focused and it was an increase um, uh, from previous years. Uh, of our Irish titles, 36.44 uh, films were directed or written by women uh, across 2019. Um, so uh, we are pleased uh, to have with us this morning, uh, Annie and Susan, who will uh, look at women in Irish film today. Um, of course, uh, for, for many decades, women 
were present in Irish cinema, uh, but their efforts um, uh, may have been underrepresented. Very often they were uh, film producers and they may not have been at the forefront. Uh, there are, of course, beacons of Irish cinema, women who we have all looked to um, for their inspiring paths that they ploughed. Uh, women like Pat Murphy and Trish McAdam and Vivian Dick and Geraldine Creed and Muriel Box. There have been women throughout the history of Irish cinema, but until there was uh, an institutional response to the need for greater representation, um, those women were, were kind of working in under-resourced capacities. So uh, when Screen Ireland and, and formerly the Film Board uh, come on board and begin to introduce uh, robust provisions to, to uh, promote uh, film women's production, uh, it's at that point that we begin to see a real surge uh, in, in women's production. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Annie Duna to speak on this uh, point. Um, let me just give you a, a bio note on Annie. Annie Duna is Emeritus Professor, sorry, Emeritus President of IADT. Uh, she retired from that post in uh, April 2020. She's now self-employed as a consultant in quality, strategy, equality and diversity. She has extensive experience in strategy development, educational leadership, curriculum design and delivery, and in equality and diversity. She has experience as a member and chair of quality review panels, validation panels, programmatic and institutional reviews in the UK, Ireland and Europe. Dr. Duna is currently chair of Screen Ireland. She is a member of the Institute of Directors, the International Women's Forum, Women in Film and Television, Ireland, and the European Women Rectors Association. She speaks and publishes on diversity and women in the film industry. Dr. Duna is a fa fan of film and theatre, walking and baking. She is married with one grown-up daughter and lives in County Wicklow with her husband, two dogs, two cats and four hens. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Annie Duna um, and here she is now sharing the screen. Annie, good morning. Good morning, Sineva. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm in a sunny Wicklow at the moment, so apologies if I'm lighting up um, the screen here. Um, it's always good to share what Screen Island has been doing around here. And as Sineva said, we would normally do that as part of a spotlight panel. But what I want to do is just share some of the statistics with you in a moment and then look at some of the positive action initiatives that Screen Ireland has done uh, from which we've seen a very positive outcome. So you may remember back in 2015 Screen Ireland put together our six-point plan to increase the number of women filmmakers and women's representation in film and we set ourselves quite an ambitious target of 50-50 in funding to female writers, directors and producers by 2020. And I'm going to share a slide with you in a moment that shows you where we are. Now, 2020 has been a bit of an oddball for us in that um, our production in Ireland pretty much stopped completely. So we are just crunching the first quarter of 2020. So what I'm going to share with you is the figures for 2019. So the stats are produced and are available on Screen Ireland website. We do that every quarter, which was one of the commitments we made in our six point plan, because we want to be as transparent as possible to show you what are the applications that we're getting for development, production, anime, documentary from women writers, producers and directors, where are the protagonists in those stories? And we want to show you the outcome of what we feel are a number of positive action initiatives that we've taken. So Stephen, if I could have slide one, please. Okay, slide two. Okay, so the important figure was 50-50 by 2020. So these are the total stats for 2019 across film, TV, drama, documentary, animation, and shorts. So pretty much the whole gambit of of all the funded projects in 2019, 37%, these were successful projects, had a female director attached. And 43% of all funded projects had a writer. Now, if we went to producers, that actually is very high. That's something like 69%. But we've always had far better representation over the years from women producers, uh, projects led by women producers than directors and writers. So we're not at the 50-50. But actually, if you look at the bottom of the screen, that figure was 10% female directors in 2015 and 27% female writers. So we've come an awful long way. And we're hoping that by the end of 2020, 
with the projects that we have in train uh, by 2021, sorry, because 2020 is, is very difficult for us with COVID, we're hoping to get to that 50%. So to go from 10 to 37, I think in five years has been good progress, 27 to 43. Um, again, we're seeing some positive progress there. So as I say, all the stats in much more detail are available on the Screen Island website. So Stephen, next slide, please. So what have we done in 2019-2020 that our female-focused gender initiative? So we had our point of view scheme that was a scheme, a female writers, producers, directors scheme, and that was a competitive process. We wanted teams of women to give us projects, and four of those point of view projects are going into production this year. So that's really good to see. We had a, a wonderful scheme called Cross Pollinator that was a cross-disciplinary professional development initiative for female talent that ran over a number of weekends, was provided free for women talent and brought together creative teams to look at developing female-led and female teams. We had a female-led short film lineup at uh, DIFF, Dublin International Film Festival in 2020. And we did achieve 50-50 gender parity across our new writing and short film schemes that we announced in 2020. Now, I know that what people say is if you look at the big productions, you know, we're still not at the 50-50, we're good at the gender parity and the short schemes, but we have made significant progress in the big productions. And I will say that a number of the major production companies this year have also gone into production with very female-led projects with significantly increases in directors and writers who are women. So we're beginning to see the big production companies take this issue seriously. One of the things we do in Screen Ireland, um, and we've just done it for the latest slate development round, is we now ask for a gender and diversity plan and a strategy, and we take those very seriously. If you were to look at the applications vis-a-vis -vis the successful projects, women's applications are less than the successful projects. So the strike rate is good for female-led and female-developed projects. And we're also looking at the whole issue of diversity across the board. So next screen, next screen, Stephen, please. So here's some of the uh, successes. So this is the wonderful Herself, um, which as you may know, I did incredibly well at Sundance Film Festival 2020. Next one. Sea Fever, Nasa Hardiman's uh, feature debut, again, hugely successful. And again, I would encourage uh, women to have a look at the films that are about and by women and go and see those films, support them. Next one, please. Uh, the eighth, the documentary, obviously, um, about the referendum, the abortion referendum, which again, very critically acclaimed at Hot Dogs 2020, one to watch out for this year. Next, next please. Girl from Mogadishu. Looking at, at the broader issue of diversity, uh, Mary McGurkin's wonderful film. Um, again, you know, very important, lots of female talent involved in that um, film, telling a very important female story. Next one, please. So what are we doing at the moment? Obviously we are still aiming for the 50-50 by 2021 now. Um, if we get to it by the end of 2020, that would be great. But as I say, you know, production is, is somewhat um, halted as, as you know. So we're looking at the expansion of our diversity initiatives to include class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and disability. And we're looking at how those intersect with gender, because obviously we have working class black, traveler, LGBTQ plus women, and that we are very interested in the intersectionality on that. And we also want more projects that are representative of contemporary Ireland. Um, you know, this, this is important for us and our most recent slate development. We were casting an eye not only at gender, but at what is the representation of stories and diverse stories that are being told across Screen Ireland. So we are continuing to promote women talent. We're continuing with a number of schemes, women only schemes, and our project managers are very carefully keeping an eye on those statistics and working with production companies and individuals to develop the next generation of women's talent. We're also interested in women who have made a film, who perhaps made one film and are looking to make another and how we can support the broad range of women right across the, uh, the Screen Ireland initiatives. And I think that might... Neva, I was just saying that, that's a, a kind of overview very quickly of where we are at Screen Ireland now. So I'm gonna hand over now to Susan Liddy um, 
to give us an international context for women uh, in film and television and how Ireland is positioned uh, relative to other uh, countries and their initiatives. Uh, Dr. Susan Liddy lectures in the Department of Media and Communication Studies in MIC, Limerick. Right. So uh, Susan is Chair of Women in Film and Television Ireland and a member of the Advisory Board of Women in Film and Television International. She's also a board member of the Writers Guild of Ireland and Chair of their I Equality Action Committee. Her edited collection, Women in the Irish Film Industry, Stories and Storytellers, was published in February 2020 by Cork University Press and will be launched uh, within the hour by Una Mullally. And as if one book on women and film is not enough, uh, in August she will publish another book on gender equality and the in international film industry. Uh, her book, Women in the International Film Industry, Policy, Practice and Power, will be published by Paul Grave Macmillan. So I'm going to hand over now to Susan Liddy. If Steve, Stephen, who we're referring to is my colleague Stephen Boylan um, from our marketing department, who is the uh, guru behind it, the Wizard of Oz between uh, tweaking our strings. So Stephen, can you line up Susan there for us? Thank you. Hello, Susan. Hi, good morning to everyone. And uh, it's, it's great that there are so many of you at home and also surreal that there are many of you out there that we can not see and engage with in the way that we normally would uh, in the IFI. So thank you, first of all, to the IFI, to Stephen and Suniva for doing everything uh, to make this uh, as streamlined as possible. It's not easy. It's not easy as Annie and I know, uh, trying to line it up. Um, so thanks very much for your presentation, Annie. Uh, what do I want to say to that? There are so many things, as we were saying initially, that we could say. So many notes beside me here, and I only hope I remember half of it. Um, okay, what would I say? I would start by saying that there is nobody, I think, um, who could reasonably say that Screen Ireland has not uh, made every effort to create change. I think that's true. Um, and uh, they share the same vision as many of us uh, in the uh, industry. Uh, and I'm speaking now today just to say uh, for, um, you know, Women of Film and Television and uh, the Writers Guild, both of which I'm involved in. Um, and I know that this conversation is primarily about probably Screen Ireland because it's in Annie and I in conversation. <clears throat> but before saying anything, I would also like to acknowledge the contribution uh, of the BAI. Uh, because the BAI, um, they, they were slower to get involved. They were, they, it took a little bit longer. They, 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 they have a different system. Uh, but I, I do think they have changed the way that they do business. And it was actually only a few days ago that they very kindly sent me statistics I, I needed for something I'm writing. I haven't had a chance to look through them, but I know there has been improvement there. So I would just like to acknowledge that be before a beginning. So, um, okay, so Screen Ireland have a gender policy and I'm just looking at those uh, stats uh, and I understand we're, we, 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 uh, we can't, uh, we're kind of very much in confusion in 2020, but certainly as those stats show, there has been improvement and it's very, very welcome improvement. Um, I would say that um, on the international stage, a Screen Ireland can certainly hold its head up because there are the difficulties it faces, the challenges it faces, the, the areas where they are not strong yet are shared by other funders across uh, uh, Europe and the world, actually. Um, so, uh, you know, like once you go past the Nordic countries, dipping down below 30 percent is quite uh, commonplace. And in fact, there, you know, for, for directors particularly, like the likes of Italy and the UK are really very, very poor. Uh, so all of that has to be said. Uh, so I'm not in the business at all today. Uh, because those of you who are used to spotlight and have shown up year on year know that it can be quite robust. Uh, Annie and I are both well able for robust conversations. That's our business. That's where we're, you know, we're we're representing certain people and and, and certain organisations. Um, but today, I don't think there's any point nitpicking about you know which percentage and when it, it, it when it's all around the same area. There is no point nitpicking about small things. Um, so I suppose I would say to right now, congratulations on those 2019 figures. They look good. Uh, they are an improvement because for sure we would not be saying anything like this if we were to go back to 2014. We wouldn't be in, in, having those discussions. So I think fair is fair. You have to acknowledge those things or else it just becomes a slagging match, to be quite honest with you. And, we, and the, the, the irony of it is that most of these people, and a lot of them are women, all want the same thing. So that has to be said. 
I would probably move on by saying the difference as I see it between WIFT, the Writers Guild, and all those similar organizations and Screen Irish is not in the vision. It's in the fact that we, in organizations I represent, have influence, undoubtedly. But what we do not have is power. We don't have power. And so we don't have power and we don't have the budget to make things happen. So I suppose that is what puts Screen Ireland out there uh, to be challenged consistently because there are things that they, they can actually bring to fruition that we cannot do. It's not to say that we are enemies or arguing or not on the same page because that's not true. So I would say just a couple of things to be said. What worries me sometimes is the fact that we, we have to be careful not to congratulate ourselves too much. We have to also be careful that we don't assume that progress is going to just you know, increase and encourage and that momentum is going to automatically build. That's not necessarily the case. We know that you can have reversal. We know you can have rollback. And this is what makes the, the, the onward uh, movement, the onward work, which by the way, takes a heck of a lot of energy and time and focus. And any of us uh, working for these issues knows that. Um, so we, we need to kind of proceed, I think, um, as if there is no tomorrow on this. We need to keep pushing so that we don't fall back. Um, but there are a couple of issues. I mean, wherever you look, we know that women are clustered into, like we say, if you look at makeup, costume, casting, there's lots of women there. If you look at uh, post-production areas, editing, sound, any of those things, no, very small numbers. We also know that we're, we usually end up talking about writer, director, producers, and we don't seem to have a problem with producers, although I would argue that there may be a, a question of the extent to which the producers who are working in the Irish film industry are the power brokers or whether they are smaller producers working on a lower budget uh, schemes. I don't know the answer fully to that. I do know that Geraldine Freed wrote a very interesting um, MA, uh, research MA on this topic and uh, raised that point there, which I thought was an interesting one. Um, but I know that a lot of women in the industry do get fed up hearing about writer directors all the time. And I know that the rationale is writers and directors, if they get their work on screen, will bring women with them. And I think that it's true that I have heard from um, particularly women working on set who would say female producers are great for us because they look out for us. They're looking for the woman who can, you know, do particularly maybe non-traditional jobs. They're looking out for, for women. Uh, but it's also true to say, you have to, you know, we have a capacity where writers and directors are concerned. We don't, in some areas, have the capacity. We have to build capacity. It has to be done back in education. We know that, and I'm preaching to the converted here because this is Annie's area and something she's very interested in. We have to go back and really, I suppose, get women interested in, in, in fields that they have shunned to date. And that's part of a whole big government uh, requirement. I think that's needed. It's part of that whole STEM discussion. But I would just say this, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at time and unclear, just maybe just not to dog the conversation, I would say this much. If you look across the world, you're finding that women are getting the less prestigious gigs. They are getting less funding they are being marginalized and pushed to the side. And yes, there are struggles to overcome that. We don't want, just because we're doing well, we don't want, I think, to endorse that. We want to do better than that. That's how I see it. We have actually, uh, what have we achieved in terms of equality in so many different areas over the last few years? So I would like us to start thinking, you know, just because other people are saying it's very, very difficult to move beyond this, we don't have to. Uh, it's difficult for women wherever you look. It's difficult to break in. It's difficult to get anything past one and done. And here's a terrible statistic. Globally, 3% of the work of female directors gets exhibition. Now, that's a scary thing. So what I'm saying is there just can't be enough done for women, as far as I'm concerned, because things are that bad. And, but we'll talk a little more about that. I will say that I want 50-50 for sure. And I would like to say, Screen Ireland, if we're not going to get there automatically, how are you going to get us there? Because you're the guys to do that. But I would also say that within that 50%, we need a variety of voices. We do need diverse voices in there. And I would be very supportive of that. So is that my time up, Sineva? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Um, Annie, would you like to unmute there and uh, 
Sorry, Sunny. We can I Thanks, Sunny. Would you like to respond to yeah. what Susan has suggested there? Yes, absolutely. And, and Susan and I, as you know, um, often have these conversations. And I'm there, Susan. I think the issue, I mean, I've made a note on some of them, so I'll go through them. The issue of, of rowing back, um, you know, the, the way that Screen Ireland has been trying to tackle that is to get the whole gender initiative written into the DNA of the organisation. So in our policies, in our practices, in our applications for funding, in the kind of people that we employ, um, you know, in the sort of people that we hope the department will look for on the board, you know, we've asked them to put um, a, a, a commitment to and a track record in gender equality and gender initiatives and diversity as one of the criteria for new board members. So it's not about individuals leaving and moving on. It's about how you embed that commitment to gender and diversity within the policies and practices within Screen Island. Um, there is a huge issue around crew, around designers, makeup artists, um, all of those, we know they're heavily gendered and that's something that we're looking at. What can we do? What kind of schemes, what kind of initiatives? And Screen Skills Ireland has done some very good uh, programs and, and supports for the crew. So that's something that we are very aware of. Certainly the, the issue of lower budgets, it has been the case but it's beginning to change. We've seen, you know, if you look at, at Sea Fever, for example, um, if you look at herself, if you look at some of the bigger projects that have come through in the past years, those are big budget projects and our slate development that is, um, we've just approved and, and uh, just about to let people know about, has some big budgets in there, you know, some good money putting into slate development for female companies. So we are beginning to tackle that. And um, we are, highly regarded on the world stage you know when i speak in Cannes and, and other places we are told that ireland has a commitment to this and that we're doing very well but we are not complacent we see the right-wing backlash against women not just in the film industry but in every aspect of life we see that across the world even in our neighbors in the uk we see it in europe we see it in the usa we've also seen um and, and we may talk about this a bit more later Sadiva, the impact of covid19 on women's lives yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Complacent. we i think are looking at what we can do to continue the good work that screen ireland has done being always mindful of the pressures for you know that that to roll back internationally education is hugely important and you know i've written an article on women in film education in, in susan's wonderful book that's come out it's very important we get into primary secondary and third level and start encouraging women into film start encouraging them to think about film careers to think about getting involved in film from a very early age because i really think that's the way forward so maybe just there Sunibra, a couple of um answers to some of those points yeah, thanks, Annie. And I might um, work contrary to what I said initially and take some uh, audience questions now as they speak to what you've just been speaking about. Uh, I have a question from an anonymous attendee who's, who asks about the high number of women producers uh, who appear to be engaged more in small projects, but not in the high end profile budget, uh, the, the, the high profile budget productions. Is that something that you're conscious of, Annie, and is, is that something that can be addressed? Are you with us, Annie? You're, you're, you need to unmute again. Should I answer that in the meantime, Suniva? Yeah, if you'd like to take it, Susan. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll just jump in and Annie can come afterwards. I mean, I think that we're, whatever, uh, whatever form you find yourself at, the uh, producers always is, is something that comes up a topic. And certainly, uh, anecdotally, um, certainly talking to, uh, to, to writer directors, there is a sense that uh, the big players have never signed up to this with the gusto that mm -hmm. others have. And this is not to brand all producers the same or indeed to specify, you know, but we're talking about the power brokers who really haven't really signed up. And there would be many stories, you know, that people would tell and they uh, a sense that it's very, very difficult even to get a look in, to get your, you know, to, to, to even have your work considered and so on. And so, yes, I, my response there, I suppose, would be that I do think that that, that is an issue with producers, that there are many, and as I, and I quoted Jody Creed's work there, um, there are many um, there are many producers who are producing, I think, a smaller, um, a smaller um, 
uh, productions. And of, but of course, there are also many female producers who have their own companies and who are known to be very proactive in terms of gender. So I'm, I'm not trying to, to uh, paint everyone with the same brush, but I do think it's reasonable. And this, and like if you were out talking to people, the sense are that you could count, uh, you know, a number of companies, let's say not beyond your, my, 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 my 10 fingers, but a number of, of big companies who have shown absolutely no interest in it and do not want to be told who or what they should think about doing and uh, who, who are um, very resentful. Uh, now, I'm not going to, I'm not saying that that's a public conversation or that even they would acknowledge that, but that's the perception out there. Okay. Annie, could I draw you in there and ask you, you know, are there production companies with Hef to who, who might actually be promoting women who are actively uh, drawing women, women into productions? Are, are there people that you would like to draw attention to? Well, it's, yeah, there are. And I, I mean, I think there are some production companies, as Susan has said, who are excellent and who have begun to um, take the issue of, of women's stories and, and women talent and crew seriously and helped I have to say by the fact that Screen Ireland put in an additional 100,000 yes. euro um, if projects had female talent and, and female crew attached and money talks you know that so you know you could argue on the one hand that putting additional funds into projects helps the production companies to focus their attention mm -hmm. but there have been some Cineva who have come an awful long way in recognizing the need for diverse stories and the um, introduction of women talent and I, I won't name them but there have been some good films come out um over the past year so we have seen susan i think a shift in some companies the fact that we now ask questions about yes. we ask for diversity uh, policies we ask for what they're doing around gender is also an incentive because i think it's known out there and if i'm being honest we get flack for it you know we do get flack from mm. The men in the industry mm. saying, you know, if you're yes. not a woman, you don't get funded. If it's mm. not a story about women, it's not yeah. going to get funded, yeah. which isn't the case. But, you know, we, we do get that, but we have yeah. seen, I think, a significant sea change in some of those major production companies mm. that are now beginning to look for the female talent, mm. female stories. So, mm. um, you know, there are still some... Uh, and I do, and I do, yeah, and I do, I do agree, Annie, that I think the key there is, uh, and it's perhaps the same for uh, in many walks of life, there must be consequences for actions. You, you know, if, you, if, if you're getting public money and you're not doing anything, you can just go along your merry way. But if there are consequences for your behavior, uh, that, that makes you think twice. And, and I think uh, that's maybe what is happening. I think it's unclear to the extent to which many of these things will pan out. But for today, 2020, I choose to believe they will pan out. And I believe that, it, you know, uh, that really, it, I suppose if you're talking about carrot and stick, perhaps it was time for a bit of the stick as well. Because uh, certainly the perception would have been that um, the bigger producers were being treated a little too softly, softly by Screen Ireland for a time. Time, and I'm delighted that uh, that has changed. And um, I think the, I think if you're getting public money, you do need to demonstrate what you're doing uh, to support the policies of that organisation. Yeah, absolutely. I've turned my video off, Sneev, because oh. I've, I've had a stable internet connection here. So I hope you can still hear me. We can. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave the video off because it seems to be better. Apologies for that. Um, yes, Susan, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it has to be carrot and stick. Now, in an ideal world, we would change hearts and minds. You yeah. know, in an ideal world, we would have every production company, everybody involved in the film industry, 100% committed to mm -hmm. diversity. But we know that we're pragmatic. We know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. as, as they've done in other countries, putting in criteria around the number of women involved in projects, putting in additional funding, putting in, you know, where are your gender mm -hmm. plans, where are your action plans, what have you done? I think that has begun to have an impact. And I think the production companies know that we are serious about this. As I said, you know, there are plenty of films made in Ireland for people who don't go anywhere near Screen Ireland funding. Um, you know, and we can't do much about that, but certainly if anybody is applying for Screen Ireland funding, they will see very clearly our commitment to them having to tell us what are they doing around gender what percentage of their crew are women, what percentage of their writers, directors, etc. So we are beginning to, to ask for that information and hopefully it's beginning to make a change. I can, can I come in with two things there, um, Suniva? And just I know we're probably running a little low on time, and I, I think there are other issues we want to get in. I mean, there, there are just two things. One, just an, in answering to that whole section, Annie, <clears throat> I would love to see more of um, a career track for women. Uh, I think what we have seen, 
are uh, some really good uh, short filmmakers, female short filmmakers coming through. Many of those have received Screen Ireland funding and indeed you have hit your 50-50 with the short films. Um, uh, but many others have received bursaries from around the country, or indeed some have actually, uh, you know, used their own finances. Uh, now, th the next step would seem to be the, the uh, POV. Uh, POV is both welcome and, uh, and there's some concerns about it. And there's concerns about it because of the low um, uh, money attached. I have heard that it's very hard to pay people decent rates with such a small amount of money. And inevitably, some of the key creatives don't actually take any money or can't get, get take much money. Uh, but but so that, that's but even parking that as being a potential problem, it, it would be nice to see a way through for those excellent short filmmakers who are coming up, <clears throat> because um, uh, you know to jump straight onto a feature seems to be problematic, and of course you have to win over producers as well. So uh, I'd like to see that. But I wonder whether uh, whether Saniva and Annie we could move to something else. We were talking. You, you mentioned about uh, COVID there, Annie. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not jumping ahead. I know you may have more to say about this. Uh, I, I certainly am very concerned, as I as I know all of us are, about the um, the problems relating to childcare and uh, and the domestic um, uh, slack that women have had to take up, really. And I suppose um, I, well, what I want to say specifically is that COVID has brought this to the fore, but this is an issue for the film industry. Um, particularly around motherhood, and we haven't much time, so we can't get into the different parenthood and so on. Motherhood and caring in this, uh, in, in our society, um, falls primarily to women. That's not to say there aren't great many wonderful men, wonderful fathers, you know, doing uh, wonderful things. But like we fall back sometimes to that traditional notion of it being women's uh, uh, responsibility, basically. And uh, I'm delighted to say, I mean, uh, rather than going into a whole discussion about this, maybe, maybe to say that, um, uh, I, myself and my colleague Anna O'Brien are, are researching this, but also a lot of the stakeholders have now come together to see if a, a branch of Raising Films Ireland could be set up. I'm d delighted to say that that, that that is going full steam ahead. Uh, I will be talking to the director and uh, co-founder of uh, Raising Films UK, Hope Dixon Leach on uh, screen skills uh, talks, you know, the, the, the screen skills talks uh, sometime in July. So that's maybe something that people might like to check in on rather than talking a lot about it now. But my main point is that I think that we, we can't um, we can't really move on encouraging women into the film industry uh, if we're not looking at that because it strikes me as you know you're encouraging women to go in really even going to the schools talking. There's so much about the world for women that we don't speak about, that we, we don't know whether to, if we say, you know, you don't want to go into a school and say, well, we would love everybody here, you know, many, how many girls here want to go into direction, we would love third level, you know, but would you think of going into direction as opposed to production? I suppose you don't want to put people, young women off, but at the same time, there's a whole host of issues that are probably, that they're probably aware of anyway. And I think that's very, very troubling. So to me, motherhood and caring is not just a society issue, which we have to deal with, but it is crucially and fundamentally a film industry issue or all of these wonderful initiatives and moving forward will be for nothing for some people. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Um, Annie, I might draw you in there, and if, if yeah. I could fold in a couple of other questions that have come in into your response. So, uh, mm -hmm. yes, the COVID issue, um, is our response to it, uh, is it gendered? Are there particular problems that women will face as producers, directors and crew members uh, post-COVID? Um, and I think Susan touched on there on education as well. And uh, we had a question uh, asking about young women and how they can uh, be, be better focused on, on joining a film industry or th they can be encouraged to do that. And, and Annie, perhaps you could talk about educational uh, initiatives there. We had, yeah, if, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Annie, on, on those two. Okay, and, and sorry, I'm still going off. Um, I'm still just the, the voice and even so apologies for that. Yeah, all the research, Susan, shows that women have been um, adversely impacted across the world by COVID-19. And I think we've seen that potentially in, in the screen industry too, because, you know, again, the research says that it is still women who, during the COVID crisis, have taken the greater responsibility for the homeschooling, for minding the children, for looking after the house. And we're going to have to look very closely at 
what the practices are in the film industry. So I came across a, a French production company a number of years ago that had looked at providing creche facilities or providing money for childcare facilities, support for women on set, not only the actors, the talent, but also the, the crew, the directors, etc. So there's an awful lot to do about providing support to enable carers, whether they're men or women, to take a fully functioning role in the screen industries. Um, the other thing is the onset practices as well. Um, screen Island put out quite strong statements on sexual harassment and bullying onset and, and saying, you know, this is intolerable. This is not um, to be tolerated in any shape or form. So there's still a lot to do in terms of making that set a good, strong, solid working environment, not only in, in terms of, of women, but everybody, but in particular, encouraging women to be able to fully participate in uh, those practices and we have horrendous stories from women particularly where they're in underrepresented sections of the workforce on on the set talking about the terrible practices so we have got to get that message across to the production companies we've got to get it across to the directors we've got to get it across to the people on set it's about access to care but it's also about on set practices in terms of education Sinevi, I, I mean as i said I, I wrote about this in susan's book um, there are some good initiatives at IADT. We have the Young Women in Film Initiative, which is a, a three-day, um, every year, three-day event for young women, working with women writers, directors, producers, editors, talking about film, making a short film, learning about the industry. And we've seen some good progression from that into third level and hopefully on to women becoming um, members of the film industry. But, you know, right back to primary school, there are some great initiatives, the Film in Schools, Fiche Initiative, gets lots of kids, male and female, working together, making short films, but then it drops off in second level. And we know from my research that teachers, careers guidance are completely clueless when it comes to the film industry in most cases, and believe that film is about film studies and theoretical film. So there's a huge job to do to educate the teachers, the careers advisors, and in some cases, the parents who still in Ireland have quite to say on, on where young women end up um, in terms of their third level, to say to them, these are the courses, these are the jobs that are available, these are the opportunities in those industries. We also need to encourage young women in third level to think about the broad range of careers. I know from my experience at IDT that the guys come in all wanting to be directors. They all think they're going to be the next, um, you know, Steven Spielberg or, or whatever. The young women tend to have perhaps less of a, a view of, of where they want to go. So it's about, and you know, this could take forever, Sineva, so I'll keep it short. This is about what you do in third level to make sure that those young women have access to the equipment, have women only sessions, are encouraged, are trained, are supported to go into the producers, the directors. And I, I often tell the story about, you know, the, the guys we used to have graduating from IADT who would say, oh, I've set up my own production company. And what they meant was I have a laptop in the corner of my bedroom at home. And we very rarely heard young women say that. We heard them say, well, I'm looking for work or I'm you know, looking for this or I'm trying to. And we said to them, you know, stick your hand up and say, yeah, this is me. You know, I want to do this. I need your encouragement. And, and going back to the career pathway, Susan, that's really important. So schemes like the POV, the cross-pollinator, you know, the additional funds for female projects, all of those are Screen Island trying to develop pathways. There is a bit of a gap. I think there's a gap now from young women leaving third level, even into making their first short film. I think there's a need for us to look at what are the support mechanisms there. And there's certainly a gap from the shorts into the next step up as well. And there's a gap from women who make their first film to making their second film. So we're aware of all of these things. And I think we're looking at how that pathway can be developed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can I come in just a couple of things there? <clears throat> just, I agree with you about the young women coming out, with, out of college and all of that and, and changing. I, I think that young women, many young women, because I don't like, you know, we all are, are exposed to different, um, to different experiences and so on. But I think many young women do not have the sense of entitlement that many young men have. I think there's just that sense of, and also, you know, you look to the big screen and when you don't see yourself, in any shape of course it does then you start saying well who are the women in film there's loads of them producers so maybe you know that would be a route for me uh, and, and obviously that is 
so great when you see then uh, women coming up and uh, uh, making films and you perhaps can start rethinking uh, your, your pathway. Um, I think it's also very important though, going back to this notion of, you know, representing all of us. I mean, that's what, what I always, that's why I, you know, got involved in all this. The notion that, you know, we are a country, um, you know, with, uh, with not only women and men and women weren't there, which was obviously my, my first passion was to try and rectify that, but we're also a country now with many different stories. And surely film is about telling the story of all of us. Um, and so uh, uh, I mentioned, I think earlier on, I don't know was I off screen or on screen, but, uh, but my colleague Vanessa Gilday and I uh, have uh, started the film festival, Limerick Catalyst Film Festival, which is specifically about um, show, screening films and filmmakers who are trying to tell different kinds of stories. And we're, we're drawing on the BAI um, uh, uh, diversity um, uh, guidelines. Uh, but, you know, even there, man, many of the films who came through last year were Screen Ireland films, I mean, those shorts now primarily at the moment. But it was also heartening to see that our two Spirit of the Film Awards went to uh, Katie McNeese, a beautiful uh, LGBT story, funded, if I have this right, and I don't know if I have, but I think I have, funded primarily by Katie herself. And also, um, Spread the Wings, uh, a short documentary by Alice McDowell, uh, Anishka Films, about two traveller women returning to a place that they had spent time in in their youth before they were, uh, before they were told to move on. So to me, both of those speak of all the fabulous stories that we have out there. And I know that we may need, we could be talking about diversity all morning, I know that we may need capacity building so that the new, um, say, new voices, new people coming into Ireland, learn the skills to tell their own story. Uh, and hopefully that will happen. But we certainly shouldn't have to wait for the stories of those people to be told in collaboration with existing filmmakers. Surely, um, surely that at least can happen. Surely when we look at the screen, we want to kind of say, yeah, that is the Ireland I live in. I mean, so that whole diversity is such a big thing. And aging women, I'm always for the aging women. As you know, I want more aging women. I don't know what that aging is because it kind of shifts as hard as you get older yourself. But I just don't think it's a young person's game. It shouldn't be a young person's game. I'd like to see that packed in there in the diversity too. Thank you, Susan. Oh. Um, might I just, I'm just going to plug our next session, which will happen on the 17th of July, that's three weeks from today, when Dr. Zelia Saba, um, who's the author of um, The Black Irish in Cinema, uh, will come and speak to us about representations of race in Irish film and television. Uh, that should be a fascinating event. And I think perhaps as our closing um, question to you both, I just wonder about this moment we're in now, um, and is there, what might we learn um, from this current moment um, when we think about diversity and inclusion and so on, and how we might uh, increase representation, expand uh, initiatives in Screen Ireland and so on. And perhaps I could just hand over to you both for a final uh, moment before we hand over to Una Malali. Do you want to kick off, Ellie? I will, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, I mean, I, Susan, you're absolutely right. The, the broader issues of diversity um, are something that we're really interested in. And, and you know, we, we've done a, a, a few things. I mean, Carmel Winters Float Like a Butterfly, um, Mary McGuckian's project. And we also have um, recently funded a number of slave development projects that um, have films about travellers, have films about, um, you know, refugees, New Ireland. But we need more. You know, we're not getting the number of film projects coming to us that truly represent. So we've been talking to the BAI about what can we do about that? You know, what can we do to get there into the communities and start talking to the people who live and work in those communities about hearing their stories? So rather than waiting for them to come to us. Mm. And saying, why aren't we hearing your stories? What can we do to help you? So I think that broader issue of diversity is, is, um, yeah. is very important. I think also, you know, we've got a, a moment now with the COVID crisis to, to reflect on what we want to be as a society. And part of that is what we want the film industry in Ireland to look like. We're still committed to diversity and gender, but we've now got to start looking, as I said earlier, at things like practices in the industry, how we operate as an industry and how we support each other and in particular, how we support women. So I'm kind of optimistic, Suniva, 
in that we're beginning to make the changes going back to the statistics, but there has to be the broader cultural change as to how the industry operates. So that's my, my final top and slide. Well, I'd just like to say, finish on an optimistic note as well. Even, even let's, okay, let's be generous and say 10 years ago, but actually really about seven or six or seven years ago, if you were to say to anyone, who, who are the Irish filmmakers? Um, you would get Pat Murphy primarily. Now, bravo, Pat, I adore her, as, uh, you know, and this is not a secret, and she's wonderful, and I know Pat would be one of the first to say, well, thank goodness we can now mention Juanita Wilson, you know, Carmel Winters, Nyasa Hardiman, Kathy Brady, Ema Reynolds, I could go on, and of course, when I get off here, I'll be thinking of people, and even, you know, I'm thinking of um, that new, uh, most recent film that I saw, the, the, um, the Last Right, Aoife Crehan, is that her name? You know, so there, there's, there's a lot going on and, and many good things happening. And so I would be saying bravo to all that. Wonderful short filmmakers and bravo to all that. You can't just have an all-male panel anymore and people say nothing. You're not supposed to just take all, you know, poor behaviour and say nothing. You have an expectation that you're entitled to ask if a person has a, or an organisation has a gender policy. That's all changed. You know, back in 2014, when I started asking questions, it was not okay. People kind of went, well, you know, that's just how it is. It's, people didn't challenge that too much. It was considered that that's just the way it was. What we've proven, all of us, I think, is that that is not just the way it is. And that is not just the way it has to be. And I think that going forward, you need people to Stay focused. You need people to get angry sometimes. There's nothing wrong with getting angry. When you get angry, you get passionate and you start asking questions that are uncomfortable. And over time, people realize, oh, yeah, well, OK. And I mean, that's across the board in terms of those looking for diversity as well. So I think we should embrace anger. We should embrace diversity. We should not sit back on our laurels and we should uh, keep talking and keep moving forward. Okay, and just, just a final point on that, Susan. It, it wasn't just um, that we were told that's the way it is when we raised gender. Actually, there was quite a lot of active resistance to it. Yes. You know, Screen Ireland true. got a lot of, yeah. you know, yeah. how dare you ask us yeah. for a gender yes. policy? What do yes. you mean? What are we doing yeah. about women? Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't underestimate the fact that that, that was there. It was, it was actually, in some cases, a hostile environment, not just a, this is the way oh, it no, is. Oh, no, very much so. And the other thing, Annie, just to say finally, is uh, just one of your points that you raised earlier, I do understand it's not about individuals. There's none of us that are so important that if we vanish tomorrow morning, the world wouldn't go on. But I think that uh, individuals can help, of course, and good individuals always can help as well. But I think that the thing about having policies and everything is brilliant, but I think we must never underestimate the strength and the difficulty of a power imbalance and how hard it is to shift that, to make changes and to sort of re kind of um, calibrate the landscape. That is, that is hard and it's not just hard in the film industry, it's hardly hard in any sector that's trying to bring new people and new voices in. I think we have to be aware of that and we have to be ready for the fight if necessary. Indeed, and, and again, as I said earlier, you know, that we're seeing a backlash against feminism yeah. right across the world and, and um, you know, we're facing into that and, and that's a very difficult future, I think. Yep. Sorry, Suniva, we'll shut up now. Yeah, we'll shut up. We yeah. wondered whether we'd have enough material, foolishly, <laughs> fleetingly, but of course we could be talking for another hour. I'm reminded of that uh, moment in the film Bridesmaids, which is F-rated, written by Kristen <laughs> Wiig and Annie Momolo, uh, where uh -huh. one woman is determined to get the last word. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, thank you both. Um, audience, I, I hope we've represented your questions. I saw a couple coming through that were somewhat logistical and I think your questions will be answered by referring to the Screen Ireland website, uh, questions about funding uh, initiatives and, and uh, parameters and so on. And um, so I would like now to invite in our, our old friend Una Malali. Una in fact gave um, a fascinating presentation in 2014, I think, on her response to uh, women and representations of LGBT characters in, in Irish and international cinema. So she was one of our pioneering uh, observers of gender on screen. And um, so Una is a film fan, a journalist, a broadcaster, and she's here today to join us to launch Susan's book, Women in the Irish Film Industry, Stories and Storytellers. So I'll invite Una to pop up on screen. Una? 
She is there. I know she is. It wouldn't be, it would complete the morning if we just had another glitch. I mean, come on, we have to kind of. I'm we, here. I'm here. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> you, guys Hi, just, you guys just need to start my video, I think. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello, Una. Great to, to hear from you. And thank you so much for being here. Aha. Uh -huh. there, ah, there you go. go. <laughs> here we go. Here's the plug. Listen, um, that was a fascinating conversation. And hello, everyone uh, who's watching there. Um, and this is the virtual launch of this amazing book, uh, which Susan uh, asked me to do uh, in real life. Yes. Um, but obviously we're in virtual life now. Um, but I just want to say a few words about it before I launch it uh, into space. Um, on the very first page of this, of Susan's introduction, she writes about how the book is both about female presence and absence, um, which I think is a really crucial thing. And you guys have been talking a lot about that over the last hour. As we know, um, Susan is someone who puts ideas in your head spring in your step and fire in your belly and this book does all of those things and um, when you're kind of going through it there's so much in it like you're kind of having all of these moments about how the history of cinema the history of Irish film is a history of ourselves and the book really is kind of remarkable in its depth and breadth of how it kind of uh, goes through all of that stuff um, the stats about women in film, uh, which we hear so often now and need to keep reminding ourselves of, uh, I think one of the interesting changes is how they're just increasingly intolerable at this stage. Um, and I think that the energy of being sick of something is a really positive thing. Uh, there's no longer this sense of deflation uh, or a sense of, oh, well, there is a sense that things can change and are changing. And increasingly in Ireland, you know, film is this space where women are excelling and uh, in, a, a, in a way much, much more than a lot of other um, artistic mediums being invited into it. Um, and in an Irish context, Susan kind of rightly points out that the progressive stance and action that Screen Ireland has had has, you know, birthed successes and also has shortcomings. But I think overall, many women artists, makers, writers in Ireland are gravitating towards film because of the potential being offered. And in a few years, I've no doubt that given the kind of structural progress in recent years, we are going to experience an extraordinary boom in Irish uh, female driven, female made cinema. Um, so if we're looking for an Irish USP um, going forward, uh, that's going to be it. Um, so let's enable that, make it flourish, make it thrive. Before delving into the book, I um, just want to mention some of the contributors because obviously there's a lot of people who've participated in this. Laura um, Aguirre, Kira Barish, Ruth Barton, uh, Laura Canning, Maeve Connolly, Eileen Cullity, Annie Duna, Sarah Edge, uh, Clara Healan, Isabel LaCroft, Anne O'Brien, Diego O'Connell, Aileen O'Driscoll, Jennifer O'Mara, uh, Lance Petit, Catherine Stone, and of course, um, Dr. Susan Liddy. And there's just created a remarkable uh, tapestry throughout this whole book. In the analysis of Pat Murphy, um, Pat Murphy's Maeve, actually, we kind of traverse the context of the Troubles to, you know, little bits from Spare Rib magazine to upending the media narratives of the IRA, the dual oppression of Irish women during the Troubles in 1980s Ireland. But we also begin to encounter in, in these chapters how it has largely been women who formed the guts of avant-garde cinema in Ireland. And so we must examine, I think, then what is viewed as fringe and what is viewed as avant-garde and what is viewed as mainstream and why. When Sarah Edge uh, writes that Pat Murphy plays with the idea of the feminine voice outside of the um, traditions of the patriarchal structure or culture, we could be talking about um, Irish women in Irish cinema as a whole. And Susan writes um, that the, the, the Screen Ireland's six point plan, um, quote, held out the promise of reconfiguring this gendered landscape of Irish film and then digs into where it succeeded and where it fails, which is really instructive. She also talks about this, this idea of a rejection industry which is a profound kind of statement in and of itself to just kind of ruminate on what does that mean, why, and how can that be flipped? Um, also up for exploration, and Susan, you were just talking about it um, before I came on the, the, the launch, uh, is the focus of, on youth as a characteristic of 
the emerging filmmaker or the one to watch or the up and coming. And we need to really, really remove age as something embedded in the concept of rising talent or rising merit. Plenty of women are coming to and at Irish cinema from all age groups and demographics. Plenty of women in their 60s, 70s and beyond didn't necessarily get the opportunities that women in their 20s and 30s, for example, now have, but they fought for those opportunities. And it's essential that everyone, um, regardless of age, is included and valued in contemporary Irish cinema. Um, I saw someone this morning tweet that the concept of muse was invented as something so as not to pay women for their ideas. Um, and this was something that made me think about the chapter on Ellen O'Malley Sullivan, whose role in the genesis of Irish cinema, I was totally ignorant of, I have to say, and I'm now obsessed with her. And this is something that this book does, that it gives you these, um, puts forward these, these people and you can go off on your own journey then after, after reading about them. Um, and I, we all know that one of the aspects of Irish film women flourish in is as producers, aka the people who get all the work done. Um, and in Laura Canning's chapter in Nikki Gogan, uh, she writes that 55% of Irish productions during the period of 2010 to 2015 had a female producer attached. And Canning writes about um, Nikki's work that, uh, quote, I argue that it is the nature of still films collective approach that facilitated Gogan's retention in the industry. Now, um, obviously, a lot of language um, around like collective community, all that kind of stuff has kind of been commodified and bastardized by like, you know, late tech speak um, and that kind of sense of community uh, or talking about commuti community in a commodified way it often hides the very real and practical and emotional ties of solidarity that such an approach can make and that still films have very, been very successful in. And when I was reading about that last week, I was just thinking about how it's incredibly instructive for contemporary Irish female filmmakers and crews and writers and all of that. And something that we should all be thinking about now around the strength in numbers and the new connections and new collectives that can be born from this moment. Um, Staying on Nikki Gogan as well, like we can think about how forward looking so much um, cinema is that women are making or, or very centrally involved in how forward looking like that documentary work is um, that kind of stares into the human experience. Sea View, you know, is something that keeps coming up again, the still films documentary and centered in Mosny. And, you know, that's kind of taken on a, a long lasting life in its examination of uh, the lives of asylum seekers in direct provision here and how incredibly prescient it was to examine that subject almost a decade and a half ago when it's arguably only now through the work of young anti-racist activists and standing on the shoulders of those who came before them who are really working on this for 20 years um, that a large scale direct provision movement is being built. And I think that that's a, a doc we can continue to revisit. So um, this book, it kind of fulfills loads and loads of roles in a way, like it's a study, it's a history, it's an examination of cinema and society, um, it's a multifaceted biography, biographies, um, and again, it's just so instructive as a handbook and as a directory of work. Um, and, you know, as the conversations around a new ident Irish identity grow, we're kind of drawn back to women's films examining the Republican movement. Again, Pat Murphy's work too, which looms large in this book, rightly so. Um, and then kind of flipping into like, what is identity and what is indigenous film? Because for me, one of the greatest triumphs of Irish cinema over the past decade has been um, Ema Reynolds' The Farthest. Because in my opinion, it changed what Irish cinema is or could be conceived as. And there's a q and in here with Emer conducted by Susan, which is fascinating. And Emer is brilliantly honest in it, talking about how sets can be off-putting, how she had to deal with sexist bullying. Emer also says, um, quote, my old boyfriend used to say they'll carve on my gravestone. She was nothing if not contrary. Well, thank God for that. Um, but I'm also often struck by how women in film regularly talk about the, that collective effort again in creating a film. Whereas often when male directors are interviewed, um, there's a focus on their kind of singular and 
you know, lone genius. Um, and that's also a myth that Susan tackles head on uh, in this book. And in my own journalism work, um, writing occasionally about film from kind of a, a particular angle, I'm often struck by the bizarre realization that when I set out to interview certain particular filmmakers, people like Vivian Dick or Moira Tierney, more experimental filmmakers, that I was conducting the first interviews of these women in mainstream Irish press. Um, and when I think about that, you know, I think about this weekend, I'm meant to be in a field at Glastonbury. Um, I think about Emily Evis's now central role in the festival her father started. And when addressing the lack of diversity um, of headliners over 50 years, most of which orientated around the kind of white male rock band format, Emily Evis has countered that idea that headliners, um, that book, that trend just, just aren't out there or, you know, just aren't coming to us. And Emily Evis says, you have to make headliners. And the idea that headliners only fit a certain form is a projection of our own biases and the continuation of a legacy that excludes so many people and a denial of what audiences and fans are actually interested in. So the media also has a role in elevating women filmmakers. You make the headliners, you make the stars and constantly interviewing the same people over and over will continue this perception that it's just uh, those people who are Irish filmmakers or the Irish filmmakers. We know that's not true. This book illuminates that that's not true again. And as a media ecosystem, we need to move beyond, you know, the promo trail and, the pub and being hand fed by the publicity machines. So my call to Irish media would be like, go out there, find the new headliners, you know, not to get stuck in familiarity uh, or the nostalgia acts or the legacy machines and all that. There's also an analysis here of activism through celebration, looking at the work, again, of Vivian Dick, Leela Doolan, and Crilly and Moore, and the Dublin Feminist Film Festival. And this chimes with the tremendous excitement uh, this week that the repeal documentary, The Eighth, is opening the Galway Film Flag. Get your tickets to that today. Um, and I also think it's very timely this week the Cross Pollinator secured funding for the Incubator Project, and there's also new funding for the Raising Film Initiative. These are all brilliant developments. But I suppose one of the, the most exciting, um, although maybe a bit of work for you, Susan, uh, aspects of reading this book is how I think Susan is going to have a lifelong job on her hands of constantly updating it. There is definitely more stuff in here that I, have, that I haven't seen than I have. I often feel a little inadequate when that happens, um, but we can't blame ourselves for the context in which we grew up and what we were pointed towards and what was deemed worth watching. Um, or learning about or considered great or part of the canon or seminal. Um, so this book, in that way, it, it's kind of a roadmap. It's a bucket list of, you know, Irish artistic brilliance. It's something I'll definitely be taking down the shelf again and again and again to learn. Um, there's a line in the chapter, what if we had been the heroes of the maze in Long Cash, where, where Michelle Maloney observes, quote, what is present but not always visible in all communities in Northern Ireland is an available resource in the project of conflict transformation, that of women as agents of change. And this is true of Irish film too, that women have been the agents of change. Um, not to generalize, but I'm about to do it. Uh, whereas male filmmakers are kind of often concerned with journeying towards the mainstream. It can sometimes feel like that, or many male filmmakers, not all. It's often a lot of women who make up the bulk of that progressive avant-garde experimental space. And a lot of that is out of necessity, you know, where the mainstream isn't particularly interested in you, so you go elsewhere. And as a music journalist, which was the field I began my career in, I often think that it was only when the major labels lost interest in Irish artists that the Irish music scene really began to flourish in terms of a diversity of genre, diversity of artists, and at the work itself, and left to their own devices and uninhibited by uh, searching for the type of industry support or affirmation or validation that had largely turned its back. Um, there was that liberation that focused on the act of creativity and the act of doing, making something different and building something modern to steal a, a still film's title. But when something's being ignored, um, you kind of don't have to ask for permission. 
And sometimes moving away from those well-worn paths is where the actual innovation occurs. I'm not talking about innovation in the trite way that that kind of envelops everything these days, but real difference, real novel approaches, real experimentation, not trying to like get onto the busy motorway, but beating out your own kind of desire paths. So I've obviously left a lot of stuff out. It's, it's big. It has that beautiful um, American ridged pages uh, type that I, the, uh, format that I like. Um, it would be impossible to discuss in any considerable length the depth of this book. We could keep talking, uh, but I'll stop shortly. Um, Pat Murphy is quoted as saying, I used to think of myself as an artist, but I didn't like how the art scene worked. And within capitalism, industries that surround art are generally pretty terrible as a whole. The function on, um, the, or the focus on ideas of commodification, on values of profit, on repetition of success, and on this, you know, dastardly narcissism of self-promotion. So now we're facing into uncharted waters, um, a probable if not inevitable global financial collapse of some sort, who knows. We will need new systems, new ways of thinking, new voices, new ideas, new actions. And so how can we make uh, Pat Murphy's art scene or indeed Irish cinema, Irish film um, work for everyone? So with everything up in the air right now, uncertainty breeds invention. Where do we go now? What do we do now? Where is the new film base? What buildings can be used as new locations for collectives and studios? How can we embed the real provision for cultural spaces of all kinds into commercial office and retail bills? How do we turn Grand Canal Dock into the headquarters of the Irish arts and entertainment ecosystem when all those tech buildings are empty in the short, medium, potentially long term? So we can now imagine everything, I think, and anything. And with the learnings from the last crash, I think we have an understanding that the creative acts and forms and spaces that begin to sprout in the cracks need to be protected and not lost uh, as so much creative space and opportunity was before. So this book shows that the female filmmaker is not a modern invention in Ireland. We were always there, but on the fringe, sometimes being pulled towards the centre, sometimes gravitating towards the centre. But as we know, everything interesting happens on the edges. So long live the edge and buy the book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much thank you, uh, Una. Una. thank you i could listen to you i was forgetting actually it was my book of existing away <laughs> um, if i could just say first annie thank you very much for contributing you're sitting there as well a great contributor and thanks to everybody who contributed for that book is there were Cork University Press were wonderful, but for not for their problem, not for my problem, but there were unforeseen things which meant that that book took longer to get out than it should have been out last year. And just thank you to all the contributors for bearing uh, with me in what my, must have seemed like a fantasy journey. I'm sure half the time they were saying, is this, is, is there really actually going to ever be a book coming out? Uh, it's wonderful to have it there. And, you know, it, it, it was to capture that breath. Uh, that kept me going, um, something that other people can run with, something even coming up that somebody looking to do further research, even students looking to do research projects. That's, I just want to build this dialogue and, as you said, to, to just show everything that's there and everything that isn't there, but that could be there. Yeah. Uh, and I think we managed to, to, do, to, do, to do those things. So I would just like to say thank you to the, those who travelled with me um, along the way these number of years. Thank you to my uh, friends and colleagues on the board of WIF. Thank you to my friends and colleagues on the board of uh, the Writers Guild of Ireland. Especially thank you to um, my family who, you know, have lived with it also with me scribbling notes all hours of the day and night. And Una, thank you so much. Uh, it would have been just wonderful to have been swanning around the RIA, but sure, look, in the scheme of things, it's a small thing. And I suppose the only other thing I have to say is thank you, Suniva, uh, Ross, and the IFI team, just not for just for today, but just for being there because you're very important to us and we appreciate everything you do. That's, that's right. my top and short. Thank you, Susan. Um, Susan, Una, and Annie. Uh, Annie, do you want to pop in with anything else? And um, thank you for just um, so 
gamely giving us your disembodied voice for a jump. I know, I'm sorry. It seems to be a little bit better now. Uh, thanks, Una. That, that was a really good um, tour of, of the book, which, you know, I, I agree is, is a fantastic book. Uh, just to say, you know, it is about working together, Saniba. So, you know, we're working with Susan and Wifty. We're also working with Screen Producers Ireland, the Directors Guild, the Writers Guild, all of the guilds, um, you know, with equity, with all of those bodies, because it really is. Screen Ireland can't do this by ourselves. We have to work, you know, with the big organisations, with the BAI, with RTE. If they're not on board, if they're not supporting this, it isn't going to happen. So it really is about working together to make sure that women's voices are really strong and women's stories are, are out there in the Irish film industry. So let's here, keep here. working together. Yeah, you're right. We, yeah. of course, in the Film Institute, you know, we're, we're standing by. We, that's what our screens are for. You yes. know, we're always very pleased to yeah. show the work of women and, you know, we will be actively seeking it out. So um, thank you all for drawing our attention. I think collectively we're all about that process of finding and retrieving women from the past yeah. and, and celebrating them in, in whatever yeah. way we can. So thank you all very much. Uh, we hope to uh, see you all back with us on the 17th of July, perhaps, when Zelia Zava will be with us to talk about representations of race in Irish cinema. Uh, thank you all for attending. It's been a great, mm -hmm. uh, critical, insightful, illuminating day from our kitchens Indeed. and studies. And <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you all. And thank thanks you, again. All the thank best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.